Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Knowing the password and login, my husband decided to make it. Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. Jack runs, trying to outrun the storm, and the race has reached its darkest point. The end is still far away. He runs fast, doing everything possible to reach that state of exhaustion when thoughts disappear, giving way to physical reactions, rain and wind. When they begin, they instantly turn a bright evening into night. At a crossroads, he takes a path through a field. Oil seed leaves cling to his ankles. Flowers stain his skin with dirty yellow pollen, and the air smells of death. Rain runs down his feet into his boots. Now the wind hits him in the face, and his limbs grow cold, dulling the pain. Finally, he reaches the shelter of a hedge, and his legs carry him faster along the grassy path. His mind leaves his body. He wants to keep running, but knows he needs to get home. Time will tell what he should do when he returns. At home, it is already dark and very late, and he hopes Caroline is sleeping, but he finds the lights on in all the rooms and his wife in the kitchen. She raises her head, and he tries to understand what he sees in her big brown eyes. Relief, panic, regret, pity, contempt, impatience with his hysterics. She comments on his disheveled appearance, but he goes to the sink and, without taking a cup, leans over and drinks from the tap as if from a waterfall. Then he takes a shower and goes to bed. There is no room for self-pity, and life will look better tomorrow. But now he can't imagine how his life can get better again. Tuesday was Damien's day. Caroline woke up with thoughts of the upcoming meeting, and they occupied her while she got the children out of bed, dressed for school, and sat them down at the table to eat the cornflakes and eggs that Jack, who had already left for work, had prepared. She had little time to get ready, but diligently went through her morning rituals, shower, makeup, hair, and her new business suit. She then put the kids in the car and raced across town to Amy's school. As always, Amy happily ran into the schoolyard without looking back, then to Ben's school, where he joined the crowd of reluctant but unprotected arrivals. Having fulfilled her motherly duties, Caroline did her best to get to work on time, deciding to devote two hours to work before the meeting. She almost managed to concentrate, looking over the contract language and fervently hoping that her aroused state went unnoticed by her colleagues. She left work at 11.30, taking her iPad with her to stay in touch via email. Damien lived in a modern complex in the center of Dixborough, a small town five miles away, and Caroline enjoyed every familiar sight along the way. Damien was waiting for her at the door of his modern three-story townhouse, tall and slender wearing a bright plaid shirt. They were immediately in each other's arms, almost without saying a word, and Caroline led Damien into the bedroom. Time was worth its weight in gold. Damien was in good shape thanks to rugby and gym training, and the night was straightforward and energetic. They had a set script that they followed. Afterwards, they showered, got dressed, and ate lunch, smoked salmon, shrimp, and avocado salad that Damien had prepared in advance. It was delicious as always, and she only wished she could have had a glass of wine, but she had to go back to work. She was determined to remain clear-headed about everything that concerned Damien. Details and discipline mattered in managing this major complexity in her life. This romance, that's what Caroline called it for herself, was unexpected, unplanned, and something she considered impossible. Once she got over her surprise, she realized that it had to be allowed to run its course. She would be careful. It would remain a secret between her and her lover, and she would not let it affect her family. She met Damien at lunchtime, taking advantage of the flexibility of her schedule. Their communication was limited to work emails and a phone purchase specifically for this purpose, which she kept in the locked glove compartment of her car. Damien was mostly content with these restrictions. It made it easier for him to live his bachelor life on his own terms, and he had no desire to get involved in any serious commitments. Sometimes they managed to meet outside these restrictions, but only when Caroline was sure there was no risk. This was all inexplicable, not her fault, and she had no intention of causing drama out of the natural human desire for love and connection. Her love for Jack had not diminished at all. On the contrary, her cup overflowed with love, 
and as a result, she was able to cope with family life with more energy and enthusiasm than usual. Once she accepted her fate, she became happier, more confident, and more alive. This is how a woman should feel, and she was surprised by how long she had been deprived of what she lacked. Life continued as before, but became more eventful and purposeful. She paid a lot of attention to Jack to ensure that her time with Damien did not affect the family in any way, and this made it seem as though her relationship with Jack had become even better. She knew him so well and was sure that he did not suspect anything. He continued his usual activities, played a lot with the children, was affectionate at home and in bed, and paid almost no attention to her explanations for why her working hours were stretching a little to compensate for long lunch breaks. She valued Jack for his tolerance and kindness, his calmness, his ability to deal with the children, and his strength in difficult moments. He could survive anything. Caroline could always read his feelings. And if there was ever the slightest hint that she was letting her adventure affect him, she would stop everything. This would require moral strength, but she would cope with it long before real problems arose. Leading a double life was a challenge, but one that she handled with flying colors. When she retires and becomes a grandmother, she will look back on this time with pride and pleasure. Living life to the fullest is the duty of every person. However, this secret life was a heavy burden for her and created many practical problems that needed to be solved. One of the beautiful aspects of her romance was the passion she and Damien shared for theater and music, things that Jack had no interest in at all. Jack hated any theatricality. It was his great weakness. While Caroline enjoyed drama, showmanship, the outpouring of emotion in dance and music, and the pleasure of display and performance. It was all foreign to her work and family life, and she only understood what it meant to her thanks to Damien. Damien often suggested going to a show, but she almost always refused. It was too risky and didn't fit into the discipline she had established to protect Jack and the children. She had no intention of spending evenings away from home and did not want to risk being seen with her lover among the local spectators. She wanted Damien to get over it, and she didn't like that he kept pushing it. The occasions when they could afford to relax and indulge in debauchery were rare. Damien once took time off while she was in London overnight for work, and they went to the opera and spent the night in a hotel. Another time, Jack had to take the children to her parents and leave them there for the weekend. Usually, she went with them, but this time, there was a convenient reason. She needed to finish work later than was convenient for Jack. She insisted that he go without her. It was decided that Jack would stay at his parents' house for the night, so he could enjoy her father's wines without worrying about having to drive back early or ruin his weekend. Come back early, or your weekend will be ruined, Caroline said, kissing him goodbye. An hour after he left, she was with Damien. It was too late to catch the show, but they had a lovely dinner at a fancy restaurant Damien knew and were together until 3 o'clock in the morning. Caroline insisted on leaving, but not before they made love one more time. She was asleep in her bed long before Jack returned, sleepy and asking for breakfast. In many ways, she and Damien were well suited to each other. They watched DVDs while eating and listened to music while making love. These moments were especially precious to her because she felt completely herself without having to pretend for the sake of others. Yes, Damien made his demands, but they were expressions of his love and her willingness to give him almost everything he wanted reflected her satisfaction. Of course, she loved him. They never talked about Jack or where their romance might lead. What they had was too valuable to risk. Even giving gifts came with a set of rules. Damien could only give perishable or symbolic gifts, nothing that might arouse suspicion later. A book was an acceptable gift as long as it was something she could buy for herself or a beauty product that Jack would never know was expensive or a dinner that wouldn't leave a mark. But no flowers, jewelry, or clothes. Even when they went to a restaurant, which they did whenever their workday allowed, they traveled far and Caroline carefully selected dishes that would not leave an odor on her breath. She ate in a way that would allow her to remain hungry for the evening dinner with the family. It all came down to having a plan and sticking to it. Damien made a virtue of his bachelor status, explaining how it allowed him to keep his home in perfect order and host a large group of friends. Being unrelated to anyone, he had no problem introducing his mistress to his friends as a girl. 
At first, Caroline was wary and anxious about this, fearing that these friends might know Jack or her other life. But she had gotten used to being Damien's last girlfriend and enjoyed the occasional social encounter, satisfied that basic precautions had been taken. She and Damien mostly wanted to be alone with each other anyway, but when the opportunity arose, she was happy to meet his friends for lunch. She understood his need to show his love interest, and for her, it was a way to take some of the tension out of their meetings and act as if they were in a normal relationship. Another benefit of the affair was Caroline's newfound confidence and energy at work. She could discuss her job with Damien in a way she couldn't with Jack, who was busy with his own business. He helped her develop a new communication strategy that raised her profile among senior management. And her success in keeping the interest of someone as smart as Damien gave her the confidence to put forward her ideas at work. Successfully managing two lives and having Damien's support made her stronger and better. She felt it ironic when the CEO approached her after a board meeting and told her that she was likely to be offered a new position as operations manager, essentially head of the core business. For the first time during the novel, it pierced her heart. She craved the job, but was pained that she had achieved success through her secret affair. Although she knew it was ridiculous, she told her boss she would refuse the offer. It felt wrong to accept it under these circumstances, and she didn't feel ready to manage a family, a new job, and a complicated romance. For the first time, she wondered if she could justify her life with Damien. She and Jack had been married for 12 years, which seemed like an eternity to her. They had a comfortable home, their son was 11, their daughter 9, and their careers were becoming more interesting. A lover had never been part of her plans. She wasn't flirtatious at all. On the contrary, she was strict. The first thing she noticed when she met Damien was his hair, the color of slate, like wire wool curling at his temples and around his ears. His height was accentuated by an elegant, well-tailored aquascume suit and a bright pink tie, and his nails were impeccably manicured. He was one of a group of unremarkable management consultants brought in by her employers to help with strategic planning. Caroline worked for a mid-sized market research company specializing in online and telephone surveys, and there was a feeling that they were being squeezed by a few increasingly dominant big players. Either they had to grow on their own or find some narrow niche where they could feel safe. The consultants would walk them through several future scenarios to help them decide on a strategy. Several fruitless seminars were held, where Caroline was sure nothing would come of them, and the dull men in smart suits seemed to laugh at their stupidity. But then she found herself in a series of personal meetings, where she was questioned about her professional knowledge. Suddenly, she felt like they might be on the right track and began to feel a sense of purpose. She didn't see the consultants as individuals until she met Damien one-on-one. -on -one. He created a cost model based on the volume of activity and his questions about its operation were sharp and demanding. They had one meeting, and he asked for a second because they didn't have time to discuss everything. At first, she was struck by his speed of thinking and the ease with which he absorbed her explanations and formulated them into concepts and structures. It was a good conversation, and she felt that he understood the complexity of her job in a way that no one else had before. Only then did she begin to notice how attractive he was, fresh, with a clean-shaven face and well-groomed. She thought he must be playing sports or going to the gym with his friends in the evenings. She liked that his workouts gave him a healthy, thick physique, whereas Jack, who was a runner, was lean and wiry from head to toe. His manners were refined, and he had the calm, authoritative tone that consultants all over the world share. Not surprised by what people said and always seeming to understand everything. She could talk to him about anything, Later, as the project was winding down, he invited her to lunch, promising to give her an informal outlook on the report's main findings and recommendations. She was flattered by his trust. As it turned out, they spent most of lunch discussing art and theater. In the first few minutes, in response to polite questions about each other, they discovered a shared interest in Broadway musicals. Caroline started with a story about her family, but knowing that this might not interest him, she searched for something more suitable to discuss. It turned out that they had both attended an opera performance by a local touring company from Glendorn. Musicals became the next topic, and soon their conversation was unstoppable. It wasn't until they were drinking coffee that they started discussing business strategy recommendations. 
The recommendations were radical, and she listened with interest to Damien's arguments in their favor, immediately deciding that she agreed with him. By then, she had already realized the shock he had given her at the beginning of lunch, and she knew immediately that she couldn't avoid what she was feeling. It wasn't because he was handsome, or because he understood her so well, or because he was cultured and intelligent, or because he had a brilliant career. He had all these qualities. But what she felt was deeper, a spiritual connection with someone she felt like she should have known all her life. This revelation threw her off balance. They talked about trifles, and in a moment, she was already in love. It grabbed her like the hand of a strangler, and while she could fight it, she couldn't escape it. At first, she didn't trust this feeling. She was a married woman with a family. Happily married, she believed, and she could not fall in love. There were no prerequisites for this. Her love for her husband was a shield through which not the slightest hint of passion could penetrate. Her heart was already full. She was not a teenager. She controlled her feelings and could not love this man. But nothing like this had ever happened to her before. Her chatter became strained, and she was sure she must look like a girl in love in Damien's eyes. He didn't seem to notice anything. He ate calmly and talked easily, answering her every question. By the end of lunch, she already knew that she had to become his mistress. Otherwise, she would die unsatisfied. At first, she thought she would have to leave Jack and the children and start a new life with Damien. She could not imagine how she would constantly hide from Jack, afraid of forgetting some detail of the deception necessary for a secret affair. She also didn't want to live with the guilt that she imagined would accompany cheating on her husband and children. She needed the courage of her convictions and a decisive break. A week passed, during which she and Damien exchanged intense emails on their work accounts, thinly disguised as discussions of the new strategy. As the consultant's report sparked bitter infighting among the members of Caroline's company's executive board, she was amazed that family life continued as before. She prepared herself and looked into Jack's eyes, knowing that her love for Damien was overwhelming her. She wanted him to say something to at least notice that something big had happened in her life. He smiled happily, kissed her on the cheek, and saw nothing. He was unaware of the significant change in her life. And instead of feeling shame, she felt relief and satisfaction that she had been able to deceive him. It was incredible. She had fallen in love with a stranger, and her husband had not noticed anything. How could he be so careless about something so important to her? She felt a slight sense of pride in her superiority. If Jack wasn't going to notice, how could he be hurt by what she did? They agreed to meet again under the pretext of discussing one of the many issues raised in the consultant's report. She came to the restaurant, and instead of a business-like handshake, they fell into each other's arms, showering each other with kisses. She played with her food, and he looked at her with fury. They had nothing to say and left as soon as it was decent. Damien drove them out of town along winding roads to a meadow where they lay in the sun under a hedge and made love. It was all-consuming, and there was no feeling of guilt afterward. They just cleaned themselves up and drove back to the city. When the sun hid behind the clouds and they found themselves in the shadows, Caroline asked, Are the kids ready for school, honey? She ran around the kitchen getting things ready for the day, starting the washing machine, putting Ben's gym uniform in his bag, combing Amy's hair while she ate cereal, and asking her about the new teacher. Jack finished his coffee, cleared the table, and loaded the dishwasher. He called the kids to order, said goodbye to his wife, and left the house. Another long day ahead. He worked with manic intensity, not stopping for lunch, and continuing for up to seven hours. Then, he got into his car and drove home. Dinner was waiting for him in the kitchen, but first, he went to the bathroom and rinsed his face with water before finding his children. The betrayal came as a bolt from the blue to Jack, and he found solace in running and in the company of Ben and Amy. What better antidote to the cynical manipulation and betrayal of adults than children absorbed in play? He played a computer game with Ben and read a story to Amy, putting all his energy into it mostly to avoid thinking about where Caroline was now. When Amy asked if she could stay up until her mother returned, he said, Not tonight, honey. You can stay a little longer, and tomorrow morning, you can say hi to her. Ill read you another story. Amy cried a little, but soon calmed down once the story began and fell asleep. After a while, 
Jack had nothing left to think about except Caroline and what he needed to do the next day. He sat in front of the TV, still unable to fathom how she managed to pull all this off. Where did she have the energy, or for that matter, the time to pursue a secret affair while working a full-time job and raising a family? Tomorrow, Jack intended to sort everything out. He wasn't sure it would change anything, but he needed to know more. He was consumed by a fear of loss and loneliness, but deep anger protected him from despair. He would not be destroyed by the stupidity of others, and he would not act in anger. He would continue to act as if nothing had happened until he was ready. Only then would he take action. Around 10 p.m., the news was on TV when he heard the click of the front door. Hello, dear. Are the children already in bed? Caroline asked, cheerful and upbeat. Even after a long day of work and a meeting with her lover. How does she do this? Has she noticed that she started calling him darling? Jack stood up and froze as she approached, a big smile on his face as she wrapped her arm around his neck for a kiss. He held his breath, alarmed by her familiar scent. It's good to see you, Jack. Hope you had a good day. I'm tired. Hot chocolate in bed for me. What a day. Ready to join me? You look terrible, honey, he said suggestively, stepping back. It's like a herd of buffalo walked over you. You entered the battle for the team again. She gave him a strange look. I never understand what you say, Jack. Our clients are generally very civilized, and I never get into fights. Jack smiled to himself, amused by Caroline's inability to see beyond the literal meaning of his remarks. When he first discovered her lies, he had decided to act as if nothing had changed. But soon, he altered that rule and now enjoyed making ambiguous remarks designed to confuse her without revealing that he knew her secret. It worked every time, causing her to retreat in confusion. The truth had been revealed to him in small, insignificant details. After a period of growing doubt, it all started when she began calling him Darling. That was the nickname of her ex-boyfriend from university, an obnoxious idiot who followed her around, offering no conversation or manners. She broke up with him after one semester, and about a year later, became Jack's girlfriend. Darling had never left her lips. At first, she jokingly called him my friend, then my beloved, then dear and dearest of all. But now, she seemed to have forgotten that Darling was associated with negativity, or perhaps she didn't realize she hadn't called Jack that before. This was before the Amazon incident, a few weeks before Ben's birthday. They had discussed what to get him, and Caroline found a computer game she thought he wanted. She asked Jack to check if it was the right one. He sat down at her computer, where the Amazon page was open, and read the technical specifications. He called out to Caroline, saying that he thought this was the one, but she had gone somewhere. The next day, with the delivery time approaching, he added the game to his cart and proceeded to check out. That was when he was surprised to see that the system offered to choose between two delivery addresses. Their own, and the address of Damien Kurd, a stranger. He stared at the screen for a while, wrote down the address, exited the cart, and opened her previous orders. A month ago, there was an order sent to Damien Kurd at the same address, a set of choral music CDs. He then returned to the game page, stood up, and found Caroline in the kitchen. This is the same game I left open on the screen for you to buy, he said sharply before going into his office. A quick internet search on his own computer brought up an entry for Damien Kurd, a partner at a regional consulting company and an economist specializing in marketing strategies. Could Caroline have ordered the CD as a gift for a perfectly reasonable work reason? Of course she could, and if he had no other suspicions, he could have ignored it. When Caroline went upstairs, he took her phone from her bag and checked her contact list. He didn't find Damien Kurd's name there, and the list of recent calls wasn't much help either, since he didn't know Damien's number. But there were no frequent unknown calls. If Damien was a work contact, it's possible they only communicated via a work phone. When the opportunity arose, he checked out her car. He immediately discovered that the glove compartment was locked. Of course, the door key opened it. Inside, he found a small purse containing feminine accessories and a cell phone with an unread text message. The message was from Damien. As usual, I can't wait. I love you a million times. It took him less than an hour to find out everything he needed to destroy his family. At least that's what he thought, until he spent an hour alone contemplating his despair. 
First, he realized that he needed to know a lot more about this affair. Secondly, he wasn't going to let Caroline dictate what happened next, and he didn't want to lose the children or traumatize their young lives by tearing the family apart. It might take a while, but he'd figure out what he wanted, and then he'd make it happen. He felt only hatred for Damien, a vicious and evil entity who had somehow found his way into the very heart of Jack's family. Then, he went for a run. He had Damien's address and name, and after many hours of thought and sleepless nights, he knew he had to find out more about his enemy. He took the day off from work and drove to Damien's house. It was only six miles and ten minutes from his own home. He parked a little further down the deserted road, walked to the front door, and rang the bell. Nobody answered. He walked to the side gate of the house. It wasn't locked, and entered the garden. Behind the wall, there was a row of houses that overlooked the back of the building, but Jack was willing to take reasonable risks. The back door was locked, and the windows were closed except for the window on the second floor bathroom. In the center of the garden was a clothesline. Jack put on surgical gloves, folded the rope, pulled it out of its fastening, and leaned it at an angle against the back wall of the house. He climbed onto the steel frame and balanced precariously at the top, holding onto the drain pipe with one hand. From there, he was able to place his foot on the fan grill and then on the ledge of the bathroom window. He opened the window wider, reached out, and pulled back the latch of the large attic window. Throwing it open, he climbed inside. It took no more than five minutes. He closed the attic window and wiped away a footprint from the window sill and the lid of the toilet he had climbed down. At first, he didn't know what to do. He went downstairs, opened the back door to provide himself with an escape route, and returned the clothesline to its place. Then, he walked through all the rooms, quickly examining them for signs of Caroline's presence. It would have been too naive to expect to find a photograph or a letter, but he still examined the open letters on the mantelpiece and the photographs pinned to the board in the kitchen. In the center of the wall hung a large photograph of a young man in a rugby uniform, a football under one arm, and a silver cup in the other. Jack looked at his enemy, absorbing his triumphant look, youthful energy, and the radiance of a man who had gotten everything he wanted. It was creepy, this intrusion into the life of his wife's lover, and he felt disgusted. He went to the kitchen and found a bunch of keys in a drawer. A quick check revealed that one of them was a spare key to the front door. Suddenly, an idea came to him. He left the house, got into his car, and drove to the city center to make a duplicate key. He returned to the house half an hour later, having forever made a hole in his enemy's defenses. While waiting for the key to be made, he realized what he had to do. The centerpiece of Damien's office was a high-end computer with a large screen. He turned it on, and the Windows system booted up. There was no password protection. Damien lived alone. Jack opened the browser and found the webmail in his bookmarks list. He clicked on it and it opened. The username and password were saved in the system. Jack had to sit down. He checked the time, looked out the window, and then returned to the screen. The first thing that caught his attention was his wife's email address in the from column of Damien's inbox. There were many letters from Caroline. He opened the latest one. Good morning, love. One day until the culmination of my week. I get excited just thinking about you. It'll bring a recording of Tanid with Pavara on my iPad. And with any luck, it will blow you away as much as it did me. I am a woman of easy virtue. For your love, I am ready to do anything to make you crazy about me. He closed his eyes, not wanting to read further. But there was more. Listen, darling, I have an idea on how to make us even happier. Jack has to take the children to my parents on Friday evening. I could work late, and we could be together. He has a 200-mile round trip coming up, so we could spend the evening together. What do you think? Damien hadn't answered yet, and Jack thought he could answer for him. But he knew he couldn't give Damien the slightest reason to suspect he'd been hacked. Plus, Jack had the best answer. He too would have a late meeting on Friday, and the children's visit to Caroline's parents would have to be postponed. Jack felt a sudden disgust at his interference, and then an urgent need to get out of the house, as far away from Damien Curd as possible. He turned off the computer, quickly checked all the rooms to make sure he had left no trace of his visit, and left through the front door. Returning home, he once again plunged into thought. He sent his wife a message, left early. He'll pick up the kids from school. Problems with Friday. He'll work late. 
It'll take the kids to your parents on Saturday morning. Okay? In the midst of all the hopelessness, this brought him childish satisfaction. If he needed any more proof of Caroline's betrayal, it was evident in her reaction. She couldn't hide her disappointment and seemed intent on punishing Jack. Of course, she couldn't explain the reason for her bad mood, so she began to find fault with every little detail. She pushed away the dinner he had prepared, saying it was inedible. She then began scolding him for giving the children sticky toffee pudding. The children screamed at her in rage, and she slapped Ben. What's the matter with you, darling? Jack asked. Did someone destroy your indestructible will? Don't call me darling, she snapped. You know I don't like that. Later, as she waited for him to read her a story, Amy asked, Why is mommy mad at you? You are the best dad in the world, and I wish she wasn't like that. She's having a hard time right now, Jack replied. She doesn't know what she's doing, and she doesn't want to upset you. Now choose a fairy tale. They soon immerse themselves in a story about heroic and magical cats who joined forces with mice to save the world from disaster. Jack woke up the day Caroline was supposed to meet her lover and was in no hurry to leave the bedroom. He watched her getting ready for the meeting. As far as he could tell, she wasn't doing anything special except watching his unusual procrastination with suspicion. Finally, when she was dressed and ready to leave, she said, I'm sorry I was irritable last night. I had a hard day at work, but today I feel great. Let me cook dinner, and it'll make something everyone will like. You do so, he said looking her straight in the eyes, surprised at his calmness. And don't overwork yourself, or he'll trade you for a shiny new model. You wouldn't do that, she said quickly, looking down. This is not funny at all. No, not funny, he replied. She waited for him to say something else, but he just smiled and walked away, not entirely sure of his composure. Driving to work, he was overcome by an irresistible desire to return to Damien's house. It was irrational because he didn't need more evidence of his wife's infidelity, and he knew she would be there at lunch. Jack wasn't a voyeur. He couldn't imagine anything worse than catching Caroline with her lover. But he gave in to his impulse, turned away from his usual route, and felt guilty when he drove along the road out of the city, against the traffic. Parking at the market cross, he called work, saying he wasn't feeling well and asking his secretary to cancel all appointments. Fatalism took hold of him, and he didn't put on gloves or ring the doorbell to check if the house was empty. Instead, he opened the door with a spare key and went inside. He took risks because part of him wanted confrontation, a cause for action. In the hall, he stopped and listened. A clock was ticking somewhere, but otherwise the house was quiet. After a while, he had an eerie feeling that he knew Damien Curd too well, like a friend. Even more disturbing, he began to admire how easily Damien had grabbed what he wanted. His heart pounding, Jack glanced quickly around the house and turned on the computer, feeling an urgent need to find out from his email how the romance was progressing. He read several messages between the lovers, trying to decipher awkward expressions of affection, defiance, and love. There was no doubt that they loved each other. Caroline's kind words were sincere. She diligently flattered and teased him, not at all embarrassed to use bribes, the promise of dinner or her body. Damien answered her a little formally and stiffly, trying to add warmth to his words. But in his letters, there was also no doubt about his love. When they failed to meet, he was pathetic in his disappointment. Jack read Caroline's message that the meeting on Friday was canceled. Jack ruined everything. It won't work on Friday. Am I upset? Of course, but it'll make up for it tomorrow, my love. You're my perfect cocktail of charm. Don't overdo it in the gym, or I'll tear you apart. Damien's answer was long, but the gist of it was that he couldn't cope with such sudden changes in hope. Caroline must find a way for them to spend more time together. Don't play with my feelings, he reproached her. I've never felt anything like this for anyone, and I'm already suffering because I have to share you with your husband. I accept the pain of being with you, but please don't make it worse than necessary. Jack intended to quickly read the letters and return to work, but he lingered, wanting to learn more about his enemy. He looked through the books in the living room, a lot of new literary prose, DVDs of classic noir films, new wave European films, and music, classical, opera, some jazz, and Broadway musicals. It was a defeat for Jack, as he felt inferior to his opponent, and he was angry with himself. 
He sat in the kitchen, feeling out of place and not knowing what to do next. On a whim, he turned on the expensive stainless steel coffee machine in the kitchen, took a cup from the cabinet, and placed it under the spout. There was room for a container of milk, so he opened the refrigerator to check if there was any on the shelf above. The milk was on the refrigerator door, next to a bottle of Chardonnay. Jack took it out, placed it on the coffee machine, and sat at the table while the machine ground and hissed, pouring him a cappuccino. The coffee was amazing. Half asleep, Jack sat at the kitchen table, sipping the coffee. The situation seemed incomprehensible to him. How could she love this man and continue living at home as if nothing had happened? But he knew that was the wrong question. The only question that really mattered was what all this meant for their marriage, and there was no easy answer. It wasn't just a matter of whether he loved Caroline. They'd lived together for so long that it felt more like a betrayal of a brother. He could even understand how this betrayal happened. Caroline was bold and impulsive, eager to seize every opportunity for fun. This was one of the things that had attracted him to her in the first place. She was also preoccupied with her own affairs and feared conflict. She could have broken his new audio system and tried to hide the consequences instead of confessing and feeling guilty. Betrayal, followed by denial, was the easy way out for her. It was ingrained in her character, and the pressures of family life exposed her weakness. Knowing this didn't make the situation any easier for Jack, but it was too serious for him to react in anger. He would like to face her, force her to admit her criminal, abusive, destructive behavior, but he had to think about the children. He had to take the full burden of this disaster upon himself. This is what men do. Marriages break up all the time, and the way out of the wreckage doesn't lie in blame. Either way, no matter what he decided to do, Caroline would suffer. Everyone would suffer. Only his suffering had already begun. Jack heard Caroline's voice so clearly in her letters, noticing that she repeated the same words she had spoken to him. He couldn't take it anymore. He stood up, wandering around the house, imagining Caroline living there with Damien as his wife and mistress. She followed him everywhere, and he could see her so clearly, curled up in the corner of the sofa, checking her hair in the hallway mirror, warming her cup of hot chocolate in the microwave before bed, head on the pillow, eyes closed, turned toward her lover in the center of the large bed. In the kitchen cabinet, there were mugs labeled Beauty and Beast, just like the his and hers mugs at home. There was a crumbling disc from the latest house DVD set in the living room, just like at home. In the bathroom, her toothbrush lay the same as at home. It seemed that the house was a disgusting theatrical fake, a mockery of the original. Their own home, full of warmth, love, and humanity, had been replaced by this fake, kitschy, insignificant copy. He'd had enough. He felt a little crazy. He returned to the kitchen, and on a whim, took his lover's lunch out of the refrigerator, packed the food in a bag, and carried it to the car. He didn't know why he did it or what Damien would think when he found his lunch missing and his cup of coffee on the table. He stopped on the side of the road on his way into town and tried some food he had purchased at a well-known, expensive local delicatessen. He didn't feel like eating, and the food seemed disgusting to him. Suddenly angry with himself, he rolled up all the packaging, including the wine, and threw it into one of the overflowing trash cans full of fast food wrappers. Now he didn't know what to do with the rest of the day. He didn't dare go to work because he had told them he was sick and he didn't want to go home because he didn't want to be alone. Not for the first time, he wondered if he had the willpower to continue this farce. It took all his strength to keep everything under control, and it was too hard. It would have been a relief to decide that he couldn't handle it and run away, letting his wife return to an empty house. But he couldn't do this, not for the sake of the children. He knew that he had no choice but to continue. He'd better get used to being alone. So, he drove home and fell asleep, only waking up just before he had to pick up the kids from school. Whoever came home first usually cooked dinner for everyone, unless otherwise agreed upon in advance. Caroline was often late when there was no need to pick up the children, but today he expected her at six. Now, he wondered how many of those late evenings had actually been meetings with Damien. A sharp pain pierced him with the thought, was she really with Damien now? He kept thinking about it as he chopped vegetables, trying to figure out where he had failed in his marriage. He must have disappointed Caroline and was too busy to notice the signs. After all, 
He had months to realize that his wife was cheating, and he failed. Wasn't this enough to prove the gap between them? He thought they complemented each other perfectly. Her spontaneous common sense and his intelligence. But now he wondered if she had always despised his introversion and lack of fun. Maybe she just got bored and went looking for solace on the side. Five minutes later, he discarded this treacherous thought. Caroline was a force of nature, and it was entirely possible that he was the victim of an accident. She met someone by chance and fell in love. There was no intention on her part. She grew close to Damien, and the affection grew into love and desire. Finding herself in a false situation, she had adapted to a life of deception and betrayal, unable to find a way out. He threw a potato into the sink and screamed at the top of his lungs. She ruined everything. She thought she had sorted out the whole mess and believed they could continue to live as they were, husband and lover, and that she could rush between them without pain, at least for her. Look who's the smartest here, he muttered to himself. She must be thinking, Caroline never lacked confidence. She had a plan, and it fit perfectly into it. She must be very happy. The kids came running to find out why he was screaming, and he made up a story about hitting his elbow. A few minutes later, Caroline came home and helped finish cooking. She was relaxed and asked him about his day. Jack thought that perhaps she was especially hungry and wanted to eat quickly. I don't know how you can eat a big lunch and come home to dinner like this, he told her as they sat down to a table of lamb chops, mashed potatoes, fresh beans, and gravy. I just had a sandwich, she replied. No matter how hard Jack tried, he could not detect the slightest hint of embarrassment on her face at her lie, nor any concern at the reminder of her lunchtime. He still wasn't hungry and gave his chop to Ben, whose appetite was bottomless. He didn't need to talk to Caroline. The children were happy with dinner and completely immersed in their world of teachers, lessons, and friends who said this or did that. He put in a few words but mostly watched his wife. She had changed out of her work clothes before helping with the cooking and put on a shapeless black jacket and trousers, pinning her hair up and removing her makeup. She looked comfortable, as if her appearance didn't matter. You don't need to look good for your family, he thought. She was relaxed and happy, making comments to keep the children talking and occasionally glancing at her husband. He met her gaze. Today, I went to lunch in Dixboro. I remembered that there was a traditional hardware store behind the market. Why did you do that, dear? Jack asked, though his voice was flat. She smiled warmly. Apart from the fake sweetness, there was no hint of anxiety or embarrassment, and she never looked away. They said they could get it if I brought the measurements. Maybe I'll go there next week. It's a pleasant city, much quieter than here. Maybe we should move there someday. It's not a very long commute. I don't think that's a good idea, honey. It's inconvenient for schools, and I like it here. The children will not always go to school. Then we could do whatever we want. Was there a hint of a question in her gaze? Why is my boring, unimaginative, reliable husband suddenly saying such things? Jack wasn't sure, and his gaze fell. He focused back on his plate. How could she do this? He knew his wife, but he could not fully understand her. She was not a risk taker and never complained of boredom. On the contrary, she always felt she didn't have enough time to do what she wanted. But now, what she was doing felt like a mental disorder, schizophrenia with two personalities, good and evil, working in tandem, mother and harlot, two roles equally suited to her inner self. Jack no longer knew her as well as he thought he did, and he wasn't sure he liked her anymore. She was not his friend. He lay in bed thinking that his marriage had gone beyond words and explanations. This was where intelligent couples fall apart. When confronted with an unbearable truth that evokes incoherent, unspeakable thoughts. Why endure pain? Why try to understand it if the solution could be destruction? Destroy the marriage, and the problem would disappear. He had to do it, but he still wasn't ready. Fear prevented him from acting. Fear of failure and loneliness. He knew it was pathetic, leading a double life. It left Caroline vulnerable to fears unfamiliar to her. Everything that was said, both her own words and those of others, was scrutinized for any weaknesses in her defense. The more successful she was, the more afraid she became of losing that success. She no longer asked herself why she was doing this. It was enough that it happened. Now she and Damien had to let the romance run its course. She loved Jack and her family, 
But she also loved Damien. She couldn't leave him. There was no point in feeling guilty. In any case, she was paying for her happiness every day by managing her double life. She was no longer surprised that this happened. Jack worked too much. He led a large analytics team at the bank, performing complex numerical analysis of investment and credit risks. She did not pretend to understand his work, but she always admired his success. Sometimes he received amazing bonuses along with his salary, but the pressure to complete difficult projects also increased, along with the frustrations of working in a tough and hostile business environment. Jack rarely showed his stress, but it sometimes made him depressed and difficult to socialize. He became withdrawn, irritable with the children, and seemed to immerse himself in watching sports on TV or reading history, a hobby that began in university. If only he had done something spontaneous, shown a little joy and sparkle. Caroline believed that if he had, she would never have been open to Damien's attention. She didn't blame Jack. She just wished she could better understand what he needed and not feel that at times he found her insufficient. He was smart and deep, and it was easy to feel inadequate in trying to be a good wife who couldn't support him. Her main goal was to keep Jack happy, and she was very careful not to let Damien take up family time. Yes, there were times when she backed out of something she used to enjoy doing with her family, but she was hard on herself, and it rarely happened. Most weeks, she only saw Damien during their lunch meetings, and the fleeting nature of those meetings made them even more precious. One of the special pleasures of the relationship was that with Damien, there was no need to endlessly negotiate and compromise over everyday little things. Who picks up the kids? Who made the mess? Why didn't you buy the milk when I asked? How did you lose my new gloves? She and Damien were direct about their demands on each other, and they liked it that way. As she got into the car to drive to his house, she felt relieved of the pressures of everyday life. By the time she arrived, she felt 10 years younger. Afterwards, when they cuddled in his warm bed or sat on the couch with food, watching DVDs, her time with Damien seemed completely separate from her life at home. So complete, so perfect, that it was impossible to imagine it could be harmful. Caroline returned to her family after these meetings with new strength, full of love, seeing everything in a new, clearer light. The first moments alone with her husband were always electrifying. She felt an irrational fear that he must know what she was doing, that it was imprinted on her body, the blush still on her face, visible to everyone. But he calmly kissed her or patted her hand with an unreasonably good mood, as if nothing had happened. She wanted to scream, I just slept with another man, but of course, she was glad and relieved that Jack didn't see anything. Her anxiety over several points was simply a result of her obsession with covering her tracks. She experienced the greatest shock when Jack told her about a trip to Dixboro at lunchtime. She wanted to believe that her terror was due to a narrow avoidance of disaster, but she knew that wasn't true. What she felt when Jack told the story was not fear or guilt, but pleasure. The thrill that a skydiver or bungee jumper feels when escaping danger. Her success made her feel generous, and she felt compassion and sympathy for Jack. Having won, she wanted to make him feel better until next time. She found it more difficult to maintain balance with Damien, who showed signs of anxiety and vulnerability as the affair progressed from early infatuation to obsession. He loved Caroline so much that it was hard for him to let her go back to her husband. His position was the least secure, and he wanted to be with her always. When he hinted at this, she calmly brushed him off. Damn, it's a romance, and we're doing well. You see more of me than most lovers would ever allow themselves to. We have everything planned, and it's important not to be greedy. But I'm left alone when you leave. You have no idea how hard it is, he said. Oh, come on, damn. You were the one who wanted a bachelor life without obligations. Everything is fine with us, so don't ruin everything. If only we could have a weekend together. This could be arranged with a little ingenuity. You are cruel. This is a useful quality. I should be like this one day. After they had made love and were lying cuddled in Damien's warm bed, he asked, Are we doing the right thing, or is this just a dream? I can't bear the thought of you suddenly disappearing. Don't worry, Caroline replied. We have everything perfect. We know how it works. Everything will be fine. But it's so risky to live such a secret life. One mistake and it's all gone. Unless you leave your husband. I'll never do this. 
But we won't make mistakes. Even if we did, everyone would survive this and life would go on. You're too good for this to be wrong. But if your husband does find out, how will you cope with it? I'll never know. He trusts me. That's his style. But even if he found out, he's a reasonable person, and I could explain everything to him from my point of view. I want more time with you, not less. I see so little of you, and that's not enough considering how dear you are to me. We must maintain discipline. We discuss this. This is what helps us stay safe. If we can't spend the weekend together, I at least want a whole day without time pressure so we can relax without me constantly shaking, thinking you need to go back to your husband. Get a grip, damn it. You're getting jealous. One day, the opportunity will arise, and we will have a wonderful time together. But you must be patient. One can hope this month. When he shook his head and looked depressed, she grabbed him and pulled him towards her. Show me why I am the happiest woman in the world. Damien's obsession worried her. This was absolutely not what Caroline had expected from her lover. His role was to remain strong and understand that her husband was the one who needed protection. She was going to warn Damien to stop pushing and reward him with a whole day of time together, as he himself had said. It's just a matter of planning and choosing the right moment. But she was irritated by his behavior, and she considered him selfish. He knew that she loved her husband and family because she had explained it to him from the very beginning. She had given him so much, and he had no reason to feel slighted. If he was having a hard time emotionally because of the affair, then he should think about how much harder it was for her. However, she was touched by his love in ways she didn't expect. Of course, she loved Damien. She wouldn't have had an affair with a man she couldn't love. But her experience in the affair was insignificant compared to his irresistible need for her. He wanted to shower her with gifts and take her away so that he could have her completely. Many of his actions irritated and upset her because they were unrealistic, but she liked the feeling that she mattered so much to this man. Few women could boast of being loved so intensely. His demands made her feel something akin to guilt, because Jack, who never complained, was the one who deserved more of her time. Instead of giving in to Damien, she realized that she needed to pay more attention to her family. Lately, she had been acutely aware of how stressful life had become at home. Nothing in particular was causing her concern, but she felt that Jack was becoming more difficult to approach in a friendly way. Instead, he had developed a nasty habit of saying things that made her uneasy, reminding her of her secret life. Just yesterday morning at breakfast, he said, Why is the coffee always so bad in our house? We can afford better coffee than this stale, cloudy, lukewarm filtered drink. I'm sure most people do better. Do you know anyone who has one of those automatic machines that make any style of coffee? Have you ever tried one of these coffees? What was this supposed to mean? I'm not sure what type of coffee machine you're talking about, Jack, she replied with forced calm. But if that bothers you, we could look at the machines this weekend, like you said. If there's one you want, I'm sure we can afford it. I'd like to try it first, he replied. I'll find someone with a machine like that and invite you over for a cup of tea. Well, great. She dodged the bullet and once again felt a little thrill from her successful impudence. But she was alarmed by this conversation. Why was this happening all of a sudden? And why was he suddenly so obsessed with a coffee machine? As far as she remembered, it was he who had bought that filtering machine, which he now considered insufficient. Returning home from Dixboro, Caroline was in a hurry to catch up on family life, preparing dinner and dealing with the children's affairs. The day Damien hadn't found his lunch, she made a special effort and was so busy that she didn't immediately notice that Jack hadn't come up to her to say hello. What was wrong with him? She put her worries aside and continued with the household chores. Even if Jack didn't realize it, she decided that she would make a special effort to reconnect with him later. When she wanted to go to bed, Jack was working on the computer. She offered him something to drink, but he didn't join her in the living room, and the idea was abandoned when their usual bedtime arrived. He was still working on a budget estimate for his work. He usually put his work aside and, if necessary, got up early to finish it, but this time he said he would continue while everything was fresh in his memory. Caroline went to bed alone. It bothered her that their usual displays of affection, so important to their marriage, had become rare. They were both busy, and the glue that held them together were small moments of intimacy. A light kiss, a silent reassuring touch, a hug at night, or in the kitchen while they waited for the kettle to boil. 
These gestures were casual and spontaneous, so it was natural for there to be more of them at some times and less at others. She tried to remember if Jack had initiated any such gesture since the weekend. Making love was a less reliable indicator of feelings. They hadn't made love since the weekend, but that wasn't unusual for the middle of the week. They usually made up for it on the weekends. Caroline decided that the simple solution to her worries was to get Jack to go to bed with her. The next day, she cooked dinner, and when Jack returned, he ignored her greeting and went into the garden where the children were playing on the slide. He started a game of tag with them. What was that? Caroline was surprised. She finished cooking the lasagna, set the table, and put out the bread and water. She added some olives and balsamic vinegar, which Jack liked, and called everyone to sit down at the table. The kids were hungry and talked a lot about their day. Everything was going smoothly. After they had eaten, she washed and bathed the children and made them brush their teeth, as she usually did when she was at home. Then Jack put them to bed, reading stories and chatting with them for a long time. She used this time to take a bath and clear her mind, realizing that it wasn't enough to simply follow her plan, but to live it fully. This meant giving Jack her full attention. He finally came downstairs, and she was sitting in her robe in the living room with the MAG magazine. Will you have a drink? She asked, looking at him with a friendly smile. No, not for me, he replied. I need to be on guard tomorrow to deal with the surrounding sharks, problems at work. I have an idea on how to relieve stress. She got up from a sofa and moved towards him. Horrified, he stepped aside and pointed to the table. I've told you so many times not to put your glass on that polished table without a coaster, he said. What was happening? She didn't remember him ever saying that before. Stop it, Jack. Don't be irritable. We don't pay attention to such little things in a house full of children. She concentrated and tried to remain calm. Are you going to bed? It's getting late, and I thought we should go to bed early. Jack shrugged and waved it off. I have a cold, and I don't want to pass on germs. Intim is a killer when it comes to disease transmission. He turned to look at her, and she looked uncertain. True, between husband and wife, there's no need to worry about passing on a cold. Maybe, but I'd rather avoid it. This is an unnecessary risk. She retreated again, puzzled by Jack's ability to say things that affected her secret life with Damien. She was worried about unprotected intimate and decided it was a risk worth taking with Damien. She couldn't ask Jack to wear protection, but she expected him to take the same risks. Damien was happy to take them. Jack realized that his plan didn't bring the expected results at home. It worsened the relationship as planned without affecting the children. Caroline probably understood that she had no chance of maintaining her double life in a comfortable balance. But on the other hand, this did not stop her from the affair. He needed to improve his game. He saw that they now met twice a week. Perhaps this was a consequence of the disappointment Caroline must feel at Jack's refusal to show affection. Maybe this was his way of making the situation worse. So bad that it could only get better. Caroline must realize that her relationship was out of control. Her husband and lover were equally unhappy. If she valued her marriage, she would have to start working hard to save it. The problem for Jack was that she showed no signs of understanding this. He read his daughter a bedtime story and sat on the edge of her bed, watching her fall asleep. Sleep tears blurred his vision as he realized it was time to act. He must be brave because what comes next will be extremely unpredictable. He had calculated the risks, and they were not in his favor. But he had no other options. He could lose everything that mattered to him. It wasn't just his life on the line. It was the lives of everyone he cared about. Fear was unacceptable. He must show courage. He knew what he had to do. Caroline woke up on the morning of her trip to London with a heavy heart due to the difficulties in her life. Jack was also up early and she was alarmed by his calm and purposeful actions as he prepared breakfast, listened to the news on the radio, prepared lunch for the children, and packed their sandwiches. He woke them from bed and dressed them in their school clothes. It was all routine, but she wondered what had changed and why she felt uneasy. What happened, Jack? She finally asked. When I'm done fussing and ready to leave, busy day, lots of things to do job, he answered. I'm sorry I can't come back tonight. It's not fair that you have to take the kids to school in the morning and evening, but I'll make up for it next week. No problem, Jack. You need to take better care of yourself. You work too hard and never relax. When I get back from this trip, I'll give you some fun, 
That's nice of you, but really it's okay. I had a great time with the kids. They looked at each other until Caroline picked up her bag and briefcase, trying to kiss him on the lips, but instead hitting the corner of his mouth. Take care of yourself, she said with a hint of concern. Be careful too, he replied, and don't worry about calling tonight. I'll probably take the kids out to dinner and won't answer the phone while we're out. Don't stay out late, you two, she said. He turned away. She knew something was wrong, but she had to go. Despite the anxiety that settled in her head, there was no time to worry about it now. Otherwise, she might miss the train. She drove to the station, trying to comprehend what had happened. What did he mean by don't call? Of course she would call, and he could at least send a text to reassure her that the kids were okay. It sounded like he didn't want to talk to her. She felt better when she got on the train, leaving the family confusion behind, at least for a while. Damien was waiting for her, and as always... He was wonderful, immediately calming her worries and filling her day with the anticipation of adventure. He was in high spirits, his mistress was all to himself for the time being, and he was full of ideas about what they could do. They quickly agreed on a plan. Shopping in the morning, dinner, hotel registration, a day of rest, and an evening screening of Anything Goes, the Cole Porter musical that had a highly acclaimed West End production. Dinner, then bed, it was a dream day. They stopped for lunch, looking forward to their time at the hotel, and it made them both hungry. Damien had found a stylish oyster bar in Fitzrovia and wanted her to drink champagne. She would have preferred to remain clear-headed, but settled for a glass to go with smoked salmon and cream cheese on a whole grain sandwich. They sat on high stools at the counter, leaning toward each other and kissing between bites. Too many happy days like this. Damien toasted clinking her glass before she could respond, but then his phone rang, ruining the moment as he answered the call. She took a sip of wine and bit into her sandwich, watching as his face paled. Damn it, he muttered, staring ahead in anger, pressing the phone to his ear. Are you sure this can't be true? A letter from me, but I'm not at work. I didn't check my personal email this morning. There must be some kind of mistake. I'll call you back. Damien put down his phone and pulled out his iPad. What happened? Damn, what happened? She asked, her concern rising. He didn't answer right away, continuing to fiddle with the iPad. Wait a minute. Something happened. She looked at him, forgetting about the food. This was no ordinary work accident. He spent a few minutes typing, then picked up the phone again. I don't see the message. There's nothing here in my email account. Are you sure this isn't some kind of scam? Send me a copy. He put the phone down, but before she could say anything, it rang again. This time he looked gloomy, listening in silence, and ending the conversation with a curt, yes sir. Now, he had time to look at her, and it seemed that he was angry with her. Someone is playing games. They sent a message from my personal email account this morning to everyone on my contact list. It seems to say we're having an affair, and claims we started dating at your work. But how could they do this? And how is it that the letter was sent from your account? Caroline was lost in the implications of what Damien had told her. Are you saying some idiot hacked my account, told everyone about us, and made insulting remarks about your employers as if it were my professional opinion? It was my boss on the phone, Damien explained. The letter's already been copied to your people, and they demand an explanation of what I was doing. Crap. You know how much some of them hated our recommendations, and now they want to know if I was honest with them or if I allowed you to influence me. They looked at each other. Her mind softened by romance, still trying to comprehend what had happened. It couldn't be serious. This must be a mistake that would be sorted out soon. So what if people at work found out about her and Damien? Was it important? Of course it's important, Damien replied, his voice tight. Because of Jack. Every few minutes, Caroline heard the sound of text messages coming into his phone. He glanced at them and at the iPad, shaking his head. Listen, Caroline. I need to get back, but you can't. Caroline fought back tears of disappointment and growing panic. How might this affect us? Come on, Caroline. Your disgusting husband probably did it. It's obvious if you think about it. Do you remember that lunch that disappeared from my refrigerator? He stopped and thought for a moment. Yes, that's it. This stupid was in my house. This is some kind of sick act of revenge. He had to send this message. Where is he now? At work? Caroline stopped and concentrated. But what do you mean, Damien? Jack doesn't know about us. I'm sure of it. Her voice trailed off as she remembered Jack's unwavering calm when she prepared to leave. 
Why does she insist that he knows nothing? The horror of her situation suddenly tightened her throat, and she choked on a crumb of bread. Damien turned his iPad towards her. Her graduation photo filled the entire screen with amazing color and depth. What had he done with it? She burst into tears. The door closed behind Caroline, and it was time for Jack to act. He knew he had allowed fear and depression to paralyze him for too long. Still, he tested his plan of action, reminding himself of the business cliche that every problem is an opportunity. He had children to protect, but this lie called family was not bringing them anything good. Caroline? There was no future for his marriage with his unfaithful and deceitful wife. He was not responsible for her anymore. The good times they had experienced could not hold the future hostage. Money, home, and practical issues. There were happy families who lived on practically nothing. One way or another, they would cope. Work? Screw work, he thought. I know what needs to be done. And I have the energy to do it. Yes, I've waited too long, but now it's time to tear down the house and share the pain. He put the kids in the car and gave them letters for their teachers. This is to let them know that in picking you up for lunch, he explained, I have to meet someone this afternoon and I'm not sure we'll be able to make it back by the end of the school day. We'll go together and I tell I'll be like a vacation. So, no French class this afternoon, right? Ben asked. Just this time, Jack replied. I'll check your vocabulary assignment in the car. I won't go to sing with Miss Pritchett. She has scabs on her hands, and she's sniffling. Amy said happily. We'll have lunch on the way back, Jack added. Great, said Ben. I do like fish and chips with a lot of vinegar and ketchup. You'll have to behave. Then we'll see what we can do, Jack said, smiling. The mood in the car improved, and they sang songs on the way to school. Jack dropped them off and drove to Dixboro again but this time without the pain and confusion that had accompanied his previous visits. He stopped right outside Damien's house, put on surgical gloves, rang the doorbell, and after a short pause, took out a key and opened the door. He went straight to the computer and turned it on, opening Damien's email. He went to the send items folder and searched for the message he had seen earlier. It was a circular letter, one of the most empty and painful messages sent by Damien at Christmas to about 100 recipients, updating them on his achievements over the past year. Success at work, a new house, a holiday surfing in Australia, skydiving in Arizona, skiing in Tyrol, then there were the rugby matches and leagues he had won, the touchdowns and best player awards, and charity work and local politics. By his own estimation, Damien was a very worthy person. Jack scanned the message to remind himself of its smarmy, smug style. Then, he cut and pasted the list of recipients into a new message. From the names, it was clear that the recipients included family members, work friends, and acquaintances from his various hobbies. He opened another email that contained a copy of a work email with several business contacts, including some of Caroline's colleagues. Again, he copied the email addresses into his new message. Shutting everything out of his mind, he began to write, Greetings to family, friends, and colleagues. I have hot news for all of you. Open the attachment and raise a glass to my gorgeous new friend, Caroline. Isn't she gorgeous? And what a wonderful time we spend together. Rest assured, she never runs out of energy. Found the sleeping beauty during one of my advisory missions on the edge of civilization. God, what ugly, stupid, vicious losers her employers were. I've knocked them down like flies, and dear Caroline is my PR person. The only negative is that she's married and has two small children, but I'm working on it and will let you know when I free her from her loser husband. Then, we'll come visit you so you can meet her in person, and what a beauty she is. Jack attached a file, a portrait of Caroline taken at her MBA graduation where she smiled at the camera, radiant and innocent on her triumphant day. A photograph Jack had always admired. He clicked the send button, deleted the saved copy of the message, removed the flash drive, and turned off the computer. Twenty minutes after he entered the house, he was back in the car, on the road from Dixboro, determined never to visit this place again. Along the way, he threw a duplicate door key out the window. He felt better than he had in the past few days. He returned home, showered, and got dressed for the afternoon meeting. He took a change of clothes, games, consoles, and books for Ben and Amy, ate lunch, and went to pick up the children. Eight hours later, the three of them were sitting in a cafe on the seafront in Brighton, 
eating fish and chips for dinner. Jack was tired and a little euphoric, slowly answering his children's persistent questions. The children had an active day, enjoying an unexpected break from school and recuperating from the fresh air and eating by the sea. Jack began to feel exhausted from his busy day, knowing he still had to go home. In the toilet, he turned on his phone and saw a message from Caroline. She said she was home and demanded to know where he was and for him to call her back immediately. The electronic bomb exploded in his hands. He turned off the phone and returned to his children. He was not ready to leave and invited them to eat ice cream while he drank coffee. Why not stay the night? There are hotels along the embankment, and tomorrow there will be enough time to sort out Caroline, Jack tells the kids. Of course, they like the idea of staying the night. He'll take them to school in the morning on the way back home, and they'll only be late for a little while. I want to go to the beach before we go home tomorrow, Ben says. I don't have my toothbrush or my panda and teddy bears, Amy adds. Don't worry, Jack says. Your toys are on vacation too. I can buy toothbrushes. We'll get up early and walk along the beach before breakfast. He tries the first hotel and finds a room that can fit everyone. It takes him a while to calm the tired and anxious children, but he finally gets them into the bath and into bed where they quickly fall asleep. He himself can't stand it for long. Lying in bed, he texts his wife. The kids and I are having a wonderful day by the sea. We'll be back tomorrow. When he turns off the light, he reflects on his day. He traveled to meet Professor Pickering, his master's thesis supervisor, and the years of PhD research he had devoted to it before family life forced him to stop. Jack had called him earlier in the week to see if he could take up the PhD again, and the professor suggested he come and talk about it. The children sat in silence with their books in the corner of the professor's cluttered office and were ordered to behave. The interview was successful, though. Jack had continued reading, and the work gave him new ideas for his topic, which was economic history, particularly industrial and maritime economics. They argued heatedly about the current debt crisis and government subsidies in the 19th century for the shipping industry that Jack had worked on as a student. It was a relief to talk about what interested him and forget about his unfolding personal tragedy. He relaxed until Amy interrupted him. Dad, I don't understand a word you're saying to this man. Jack and the professor laughed, and the interview immediately devolved into jokes and a discussion of practical issues related to returning to school. His idea was to work part-time on his doctorate, perhaps convincing his employer to reduce his work hours. The professor had found him some maintenance stipends and financial aid grants that might be suitable. Now, as he lies in bed, Jack wonders if he should quit his job entirely and study full-time, letting Caroline deal with the financial consequences and take care of the family. It's a tempting offer, and he falls asleep in a more positive mood than circumstances might allow. The children wake him up by jumping on his bed as the first rays of light illuminate the room. He dresses them for school so they are ready when they get home. And then they stroll along the wet sand below the high tide line to the pier and back to the hotel for a hearty breakfast. He then drives home and visits each child's school to explain why they were late. Your wife called? Amy's teacher says disapprovingly. She didn't think Amy would come today. There's a misunderstanding, Jack says. She's on a business trip and a little out of touch with reality. We were on holiday at the seaside. Amy adds, not helping the situation with our dad. Jack suspects that such awkward conversations will become the norm and smiles at the teacher, trying to exude good intentions. He thinks Caroline will be at work, but still doesn't want to go home. Instead, he drives to work, writes his resignation letter, and emails it to his boss. He had recently received his annual bonus. And his performance appraisal highlighted how important he was to the success of a project to assess the financial liabilities of a takeover of a small competitor. In its own way, this letter will be as big a bomb as yesterday's effort. He talks to a few colleagues, tells them what he did, and is pleased enough by their terrible reactions. He can find no reason for further delays and goes home. Caroline's car is parked in the driveway, and he doesn't know whether to be happy about it or not. Now is the right time to discuss everything. He walks into the house as Caroline furiously wipes down the kitchen surfaces. She turns, and they look at each other without saying a word. If anything, she's more excited than he is. Ben only missed the first period, he says calmly. I explained to the teachers so they won't get in trouble. Trouble for being a little late? She asks, still puzzled. 
We went to Brighton, he replies. She nods but still can't speak. Finally, she says coffee. He nods and goes to his office, turning on the computer. He sees several new emails, all in the spirit of, is it true that you and Caroline are getting a divorce? The vibrations from his bomb continue. Caroline comes to his door. It's better to have coffee in the living room. He follows her and sits down in a chair. She takes a corner of the couch, trying to maintain eye contact. Her voice doesn't waver, but he notices that when she pauses, her gaze falls, and she takes a moment to collect her thoughts. I'll take it you know she begins. He nods. And that you sent this letter? She asks. He doesn't answer. He has no reason to admit anything. This is wrong, and I don't like feeling guilty, she continues. I see that I cannot deceive you, Jack. The man I love. You mean the world to me, and I will love you for the rest of my life. I thought it would be better not to tell you, but it was hard to deal with the fear that you might find out. Damien and I discussed this from all sides, and in the end, we decided that you should know. Either way, you found out. Damien and I are dating. I love him. I love you too. And yes, we slept together. I have to tell you that. Please don't take this to heart. I wanted to tell you earlier, but I was afraid of hurting you. Her wife looks at her hands, brave and determined. She looks up but can only meet Jack's gaze for a moment. After a while, she continues softly. Damien is a good man, and if you gave him a chance, you would like him. You'd find a lot in common. He treats me well. He makes me a better person, and you benefit from it too. He likes simple entertainment, dinner, a movie, a walk in the park. We spent a lot of time there. I saw the daffodils blow by and roses come and go. I know you think I'm sloppy, but he listens to me and helps me put my thoughts in order. He lets me pamper myself. He tells me that I am a star, a beauty, and that you are so lucky to have me. I come back to you. I'm so happy. I have so much to give. Life is so full. I think you've noticed. He shrugs. I noticed that you're cheating on me, Jack says, his voice steady. How could you think that I wouldn't? She shakes her head, but doesn't dare speak. How long have you known him? Jack asks. Only for three months since we fell in love with each other. And when are you meeting? He presses. Whenever you don't need me, she replies with a hint of a smile. Her conscience is assuaged, bolstered by the minimal acknowledgement implied by his questions. Please, I love you so much and I care what you think. I'm so glad you're not mad, but you're too deep to read. Tell me what you think. Jack stares at her, the emotions swelling inside him. I think I'm dead, he mutters. No, I'm thinking, what have you done? Are you really that stupid? He hadn't meant to speak aloud, but his words are raw. Fury appears and disappears, like a low-flying warplane making his heart race. This is a conversation no man should have to endure. Jack feels his whole body freeze, a soldier after being shot by a sniper trying to determine where the bullet hit. He's cold, nauseous, and a dullness sets in deep inside, like the onset of death when an internal mechanism shuts off. Bright thoughts that aren't his swirl in his head. This conversation is as bad as he feared, and the feelings he had suppressed for so long are now out of control. Caroline looks horrified. I see that you're hurt, and I'm sorry I was the cause. None of us planned for this, and it's very awkward. I ask you to think about my situation, too. This is difficult for all of us, and I need your help to figure it out. We must help each other now. Jack doesn't look at her, afraid of showing weakness, but speaks in a clear voice. If you need a divorce, let me know. Otherwise, I don't think we have anything to talk about. Oh, by the way, I'll be living in Brighton all week, so you'll have to make new arrangements for the kids before and after school. I'll be back this weekend to look after them. Also, I quit my job, so after this month, you'll have to pick up the house bills. Now, it's Caroline who looks scared. Jack, what did you do? What about the children? You didn't think about them. You haven't thought this through. No, Caroline. You didn't think, he replies coldly. I had enough time to understand what I wanted. I just didn't see the point in consulting with you about my decisions. I'm a student again, defending my doctoral dissertation. I'm going on a week of excavations near the university library. And on the weekend, I'll come home to the children. You're leaving me? She asks. Jack shrugs. You left a long time ago. Call this agreement what you want, but it shouldn't worry you too much. You can have as many lovers as you want. 
It doesn't matter to me. But you'll have to be here for the kids all week. And I'll look after them on the weekend. Is this too much for you? Caroline protests, this is a bad idea. You have to be reasonable, Jack. It's too late. It's done. Better figure out who will pick up the children when they finish school. Jack says grimly. I can probably get back in time to do it on Friday. I won't be unreasonable. You make my life as difficult as you can. You hate me. I continue to live my life. I don't care what you think or how it affects you. Jack pauses then adds, and one more thing. If I ever come home and find your lover here, I'll smash his skull and live happily with the consequences. Keep him away from my house and my children. If you need toy boys to have a night with, take them somewhere dirty. He wants to make her miserable, but his focus is on doing the right thing for his children. The only thing that's unreasonable is that he acted without consulting Caroline. There's also the issue of the mortgage. He won't pay anymore. His income is gone. Caroline should be able to manage the payments, but he knows there won't be much available money. She definitely won't want to pay for a babysitter after school. The obvious solution, he thinks grimly, is for her to use her flexible work schedule to get off in time to pick them up herself. He falls asleep reading his daughter's story and wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning, lying on the blanket next to her. He goes downstairs and collapses on the living room sofa. Soon, Jack fell asleep again. The new regime began immediately. He woke early to load the car with everything he needed for Brighton. He would drop the kids off at school, go to work to sort out vacation time, pick up the kids after school, and then head back to the university to manage excavations and library access. I won't stay here and interfere with your social life. I'll begin my research immediately. My employers can come and pick me up if they want. I'm owed enough leave to take me to the end of my sentence. Caroline asked automatically, what will we tell the children? I'll talk to them on the way home from school, Jack replied. They won't like it, but they won't have to deal with a cheating wife. They'll be fine, I promise. I'll come every weekend during the holidays. I'll do everything I can to keep them with me. What about me? Caroline asked quietly. What about you? Jack's voice was cold. The more children I have, the happier they'll be. And you'll have more time for your lover. Caroline's face tightened. You are a cruel man, Jack. You know what I mean, he said. I don't want to be alone. I want my family to be here. All you will want is to be with your lover, even when you don't have the children. In fact, you can call in your partner. We may still be married, but I'm not your partner anymore. It's not like me and Damien. It's just a novel, she explained, her voice rising in a defensive tone. Don't try to make it seem like more than it really is. I don't care how you describe it. You love him and depend on him. I think he's your partner, Jack shot back. No, you're distorting everything. Caroline protested. You are my partner. You are the father of my children and my husband. There shouldn't be anything that can separate us. Jack paused before speaking, visibly calming himself. Really, Caroline, you deserve this mess. If only to introduce you to the real world. It was nice to have a good chat, but I'm busy. No, don't go. She cried losing her composure for the first time. She jumped to her feet, her voice ringing with emotion as she reached out to grab him. Tears glistened in her eyes. We need to discuss this. I've worked hard to understand what happened to me. You need to think about this too. Give me time, please. Jack snorted contemptuously and turned to leave. Caroline felt as though she had been kicked. When she called Damien looking for sympathy, he didn't understand why she didn't demand an explanation from Jack or insist that he confess. She wanted to go to bed and never get up again, but she knew Jack would soon return with the children. She wasn't used to thinking about events in this way, but the conversation with Jack played over and over in her head. She realized that Jack had known about Damien for some time and had not said anything. It seemed almost unthinkable. She never thought about what would happen if Jack discovered the affair. She had pushed all those negative thoughts aside, but now she saw how reckless she had been in thinking she could cope with the consequences. Jack's response had completely surprised her. There had been no struggle, no screaming, no tears, just cold determination and a feeling that she had disappointed him. Why hadn't he fought to get her back? He simply walked away from her, and absurdly, that diminished the significance of what she had done. She wanted to scream at him. Asterisk Jack, this is not the end of the world. We can fix everything. I will do my best to make sure everything is okay for you. But he wasn't there to hear it. 
Later, the children ran into the house, full of excitement. Mom, Dad's going to live in Brighton, Ben shouted as soon as he entered. We were there. This is amazing. He said that next time we could go on the rides on the pier. I'll also go see the fishing. We'll have to get up before dawn. Caroline smiled and nodded, her eyes filling with tears. Amy threw herself into her arms and buried her face in her shoulder. I want to go with Panda to visit Daddy as soon as I can, she muttered softly. Because he'll be lonely alone. Caroline strained to hear. Did he say that? She asked softly, not knowing what Jack had told the children and unsure how to react. He said that there are a lot of people at the university, but he's always lonely when he's not with us. Amy replied. Caroline nodded. I'm sure you'll see him often, but I'll have to read you bedtime stories instead of dad on weekdays. This won't work. Amy protested. You're always too busy to read properly. I'll read myself and leave the stories that dad likes for him to read when he gets back. Caroline tried her best to stay calm, but all the while, she was searching for Jack. When he didn't return home, she asked Ben, where's your dad? He said goodbye in the car. He said he had to hurry, but he'll pick us up from school on Friday, Ben replied. I don't think it's fair that he's not here, Caroline said, feeling a deep ache in her chest. She began to realize just how difficult life would become. Her problems were so numerous and overwhelming that she couldn't even imagine where to start. Her mind was clouded by the pain of Jack's rejection and his stubborn determination not to accept her point of view. Why can't he understand that I had to do this? She thought. Otherwise, I would spend my whole life feeling like I missed out on a rare opportunity to express myself and achieve my dreams. He was being unreasonable, but if she was honest with herself... She knew she should have expected such an answer. That is why she kept the affair a secret, despite her feelings of guilt and her dislike of lying. She believed that love mattered and that they would find a way. Her love for him and the love she believed he still had for her. She couldn't believe that he could just stop loving her after so many years together. But when she looked into Jack's eyes, she saw only indifference and disgust, mostly indifference. He had driven her out of his thoughts and was already thinking about life without her. When she finally relaxed and began to think, financial problems came to the forefront. How could Jack have assumed that she could manage on her salary alone? Yes, she was well paid, but her income was already fully allocated. She could never save, and she had a large mortgage. Even worse were the problems the email caused at her work. Returning from London, she went straight to the office and was called into a meeting with one of the executive directors and the head of the human resources department. They questioned her for an hour about her relationship with Damien and how the affair might have influenced the consultant's report, which some directors found inappropriate. She insisted again and again that the affair began after the report was written and occurred solely outside of work, but there was no evidence of this. By her own admission, she had discussed the consultant's findings with Damien. By the end of the meeting, it became clear that she was no longer considered a promising employee in the eyes of her employers. It was hinted to her that there was a question as to whether they could keep her in a position of responsibility, given her lack of sound business judgment. If she lost her job, she and her children would be in dire straits. This kept her up at night. She couldn't count on Damien for help. His problems at work were even worse, and she couldn't help but feel like he somehow blamed her for what had happened. He was charged with using the guise of consulting work to have an affair with a client. Even worse, they said he allowed an unprofessional situation to develop that damaged the company's reputation. He then made the problem worse by slandering a valuable client. His defense was to prove that he did not send the letter, and it was relatively easy, with the right help, to determine the IP address of the computer from which the email was sent. But this, of course, proved that it was his own computer. His suggestion that Jack had broken into his house and sent the message was met with skepticism. There was no evidence of forced entry. On the other hand, Damien had some evidence, although not conclusive, that he was in London at the time the letter was sent. His demand to Caroline was that she force Jack to admit to sending the message. She knew this wouldn't happen. When she started the affair, it never occurred to her that money could be an issue. Instead, she saw Damien as an additional asset, a man with a high-paying job who could cover the extra expenses, hotels, and dinners associated with their affair. 
Jack made more than both of them combined. His dismissal was an unexpected and weak response to the situation because it harmed the children as much as anyone. She wondered how she would pay her mortgage, utilities, and buy food. It was absurd to think that she could ask Damien for money to support her family. Still, she thought about it. Why not ask Damien for help? Previously, the mistress always counted on the support of her patron. She couldn't do it because, in her mind, the justification for the affair was that she was strong enough to deal with the consequences. Asking for money would prove otherwise. After further thought, she decided that the best plan would be to tell Jack that if he wasn't ready to take on financial responsibility, she would be forced to ask Damien for help. Jealousy should have provoked a more humane response. Amy began carrying Panda around the house with her and only leaving him when Jack came home for the weekend. Caroline told her that this was childish behavior for a nine-year-old girl and yelled at Amy when she tried to take her tattered toy to school. Then she had to calm her daughter down when she herself was tired and wanted to scream. Ben complained about her dinners. I don't like onions and cabbage, but you always cook them. When I go to dad's, I'll have fish and chips. You will eat what you're given, and that will be what we can afford, Caroline replied. The first weekend Jack was home, they could barely stay in the same room and said almost nothing to each other the entire weekend. In any case, Jack spent most of his time with the children. Caroline looked for an opportunity to discuss the future, but the moment never came. He left on Monday, dropping off the children at school along the way. When Caroline arrived at work, she was again called into a meeting, this time with the head of human resources. She was offered the position of Director of Management and Secretariat to replace her current position in Operations Management. Management no longer trusted her business judgment and did not want her in a customer-facing role. She kept her current salary as a concession, but the decision was recorded in her personnel file. If she objected, she would face the first stage of disciplinary proceedings, including a panel chaired by a member of the Board of Directors. Her conduct in relation to the consultant's report should have been reviewed. Caroline knew she would have to accept the change in responsibilities. She was glad that she still had a job, but she had no doubt that the new position was a demotion. Returning to her desk, she felt humiliated and became very angry. Why was she being punished for something she didn't do? Her affair had nothing to do with her work, and in any case, the email was a scam. On Monday evening, she wrote to all the people who had contacted her in response to the letter sent from Damien's account. This included her parents and many friends. Thank you for your concern. I can't say too much, but yes, Jack and I have had some issues that we're working through. The letter you may have seen was a scam, a criminal act that has caused me a lot of harm and heartache. Please don't spread this around or believe everything you read on the internet. The exciting news is that after working in a bank for so long, Jack has decided to return to study and pursue his PhD. Of course, this requires sacrifice from all of us but we're going to get through this. This is for such a noble purpose. Love from Jack, me, and the kids. We hope to see you soon. In a spirit of bravado, Caroline made her first weekday trip to Damien since the incident on Tuesday. She took the kids to school, so she couldn't start early to make up for the hours and had to pick them up at the end of the day. There was also a committee meeting scheduled for her new role in the middle of the day, and under the circumstances, it was difficult to relax. She was relieved to be with Damien, but he seemed tense and reserved. He didn't dress for her, and he barely spoke, as was their custom. They immediately made love, but it wasn't as usual, and it ended in silence. Afterwards, they drank coffee and picked at the food Damien had brought. Neither of them were hungry, and the gloomy topic of conversation prevented them from enjoying the moment. Damien still wanted proof that Jack had sent the letter and pressed Caroline to make him confess. Jack is not at home. He's quit his job and is spending the week in Brighton. He's clearly not in the mood to listen to me, Caroline said. Far from being disappointed, Damien seemed pleased with the news. Then tell him that you will kick him out for good if he doesn't confess. Don't push me. I don't even know if Jack wrote this letter. You may have other enemies. Turn on your brain, Caroline snapped. Damien was furious. Who else could have a motive? Know about us and have access to your photos? She was silent for a moment, then said quickly, I will do what I can, but damn, we're fine, right? We won't let this mess destroy us too. Of course, but we need to get the job done to move on, Damien said. I'm glad your husband left. 
Now you can give me all the time I deserve. She wanted to remind him that she still had children and tell him that she would do whatever it took to get her husband back, but they went to the bedroom instead. With little time left, their lovemaking was even more rushed. She returned from the visit to Damien in shock from what had happened and couldn't explain why she was shocked. Not once did she feel like Damien cared about her or that she had his support. The inn was good. Now that Jack was gone, she needed it and no longer felt guilty. But as a form of communication, intimate was useless, and they might as well have been strangers. She reasoned that they were under stress and had little time. Everything will work out, she told herself, but she couldn't escape the idea that it was only night that connected them. Now that Jack was gone, she was demanding more from the relationship than it could bear. If so, she thought, I will find the strength to mend my relationship with Damien and work on my relationship with Jack. He'll come back when he calms down, she assured herself. He will understand that this is better for the children, and we can work this out so that Damien won't be a problem between us. I just need to keep my two men apart and show everyone that I love him. Damien is worried about his job, and Jack is reacting to shock and his ego. Nothing else. In any case, he has no money, so he will have to return every night. Caroline returned home to capricious children, and there was no one to help her. When she finally put them to bed, she was exhausted and had nothing to cheer her up. She hated her new job and was obsessed with money. Every night, she returned to the basic truth of her choice. Either remain faithful and devote herself to the marriage or take risks and put her relationship with Jack in danger. She chose the risky path and could only blame herself for the way things turned out. It was embarrassing to think about how she had looked forward to the weekend. Instead of two disgruntled children, there was handsome Jack and her children, so excited that they could hardly sit at the table. She cooked the family dinner, and Ben didn't complain. Jack told the kids about his week. He worked in the library all morning, ran at lunch, and sometimes gave lectures. Caroline listened with interest, but did not make any comments until late in the evening, when the children went to bed. She said, Jack, I'm really having a hard time coping without some financial help from you. These are your children, just like mine, and they deserve better than they get. You must understand this. No problem, Jack replied. Give up the champagne and smoked salmon lifestyle, and you'll have enough to get by. If this is too much for you, then file for divorce. I'm sure the court will force me to pay something, even for my modest salary. She was shocked. She didn't understand why he had to speak with such anger, especially after he had been so nice at dinner. Jack, be serious. My children are always hungry when I meet them. Are you spending all your money on your lover? Maybe they should stay with me. What little I have, I spend on them. I feed them soup and bread when I have little money. They love it. They are never hungry. I feed them constantly. Everything I have, I leave for them. He looked at her intently, and she looked away. Can you honestly say that they are your top priority? He asked. I don't think so. Nice try, Jack to make me feel guilty, but you were the one who quit your job and left your family. Why should a woman always take the blame? He shrugged. Because this situation was created by you. There was no point in arguing. It would only push Jack further away, and Caroline cursed herself for her bad tactics. She truly believed that leaving his career was a weak response from Jack, an unnecessary measure that would only harm the children. They used to share expenses, and Jack was responsible for the mortgage and utility bills. Together, this amounted to more than the rest of Caroline's salary. This upset her, even though she reminded herself that she still had a house, children, a job, and a lover. The only thing missing was a husband, and she was going to get him back. She had to remain patient and give him time to recover from the anger and stubbornness that had caused him to move away and quit his job. He had hurt the children, but he would eventually realize his mistake. As for returning to university, she thought it was absurd for a man of his age with family responsibilities. She had thought better of him and believed he would fight to overcome their temporary problems. She would tell him that she expected more from him. Problems crept up unnoticed. She could no longer pay off her credit card in full every month. She cut back on non-essential expenses, including treats for the children. She had to arrange after-school childcare, which added new costs. Long lunch breaks were now impossible because she couldn't stay late to make up the hours and pick up the kids. The children were unhelpful, misbehaved, 
and demanded attention when she wanted to be alone. At first, Damien was calm about the new obstacles to their meetings. He told Caroline that he was glad Jack left because now he didn't have to share her. I'll still bring Jack back, she replied. This does not affect our relationship in any way, and I want everything to be as before. He was not allowed to come into the house because of the children, and after the first unsuccessful attempt, they abandoned their lunchtime meetings. Now they could only meet on weekends when Jack was at home with the children, but Damien played rugby on Saturdays with trips before and after if there was an away game. On Sunday afternoon, he would meet friends at the pub to watch football and play cards. The weekend was the time when Caroline really needed to work on her relationship with Jack. It hurt her that he looked happy when she left. She planned to spend the first weekend of the new regime from Saturday evening to Sunday afternoon with Damien. They were going to have dinner and spend the whole night together. She would then return to cook Sunday dinner for the family while Damien went out to meet his friends. Jack, however, announced that this did not fit into his plans. I haven't seen my kids all week, and I intend to spend time with them. We're going to Whipsnade Zoo on Sunday. You can go if you want. I won't stop you, but we're leaving at 9 o'clock, and we'll be back late in the afternoon. Go to your lover, but don't worry about lunch. We'll have lunch out. Caroline was stunned and speechless for a moment. This was a key decision. She couldn't resist seeing Damien after she had promised him she'd be with him. But she didn't like the thought of Jack taking the kids out without her. You could have told me sooner, she finally said. I would like to go, but I can't change my plans. No problem, he replied and went out into the garden to start throwing the ball to his son. She knew she had been played. She went to make some coffee while she thought about what was happening. When the coffee was ready, she went out into the backyard and watched Jack throw the ball to Ben. I made coffee, she called. Thank you, Jack replied, continuing the game. While she drank the coffee alone, his cup growing cold. She finally decided that if that was his attitude, she would go ahead with her plans and not waste her energy on Jack until he became more receptive. He needed more time to accept the new order. She sent Jack the plan for the following weekend, so he would be warned and could not claim that it was inconvenient. She had to carefully negotiate with Damien. He had given up his Sunday lunch, and she would be with him from midnight on Saturday until 5 p.m. on Sunday. She wrote to Jack, Asterisk the children really enjoyed Whipsnade. It was a great idea and I'm just sorry I couldn't go. But this weekend, there are no problems. The kids said several times that they wanted to go to Fantasy World, which is 30 minutes away, so we'll go early on Saturday and spend the whole day there. It will be great to be together as a family again. Asterisk he didn't respond right away. When the answer came, it was brief. Asterisk great idea, but not with me. I need to buy something on Saturday and prepare a lecture in the afternoon. Asterisk, she called him immediately. Really, Jack, don't play games. The children will be very disappointed. Not if you take them. She wasn't going to admit that the plan would only be acceptable to the kids if Jack went. All week, they had pestered her with questions about how long it was until the weekend, how they would like to be at Sea World, how her food was terrible, and what they would do with Jack when he arrived. She knew Jack wouldn't change his mind about the weekend. His plan was to do everything he could to stay away from her. For the first time, she began to think that it might be impossible to get Jack back unless there was a change in her relationship with Damien. She needed to spend the whole weekend with Jack. She needed time and space to show her charms. She texted him back. Okay, not this weekend. Everyone is disappointed. One day of vacation solved the problem. For one weekend... She spent a delightful day with Damien midweek from dropping the kids off at school until she went to pick them up from after-school activities. In exchange, she stayed home to take care of Jack for the entire weekend. It was a brief relief in the hopeless grayness of her new life. Jack and Damien must have realized how much she needed their company. What do you think of our story today? In my opinion, the man did the right thing to find out from his wife everything he thought was suspicious because there is no other way to find out. What do you think? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.